All right. Well, hey, sir, I appreciate you taking time. I know it's a Friday afternoon, so uh, I would love for you to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, where you came from, and what you're doing now. Yeah, sure thing, Aaron. I really do appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you this afternoon, and it's a great way to start the week and hanging out with you for an hour. Um, so, Lucian E. Meyer. Uh, so, I've uh, been um, in mostly federal government my professional career. I'm an Air Force vet and then uh, spent 11 years on the United States uh, Senate Committee on Armed Services professional staff. Uh, where a small group of us kind of uh, make recommendations and propose legislation uh, for the senators to actually act upon. So 11 years on the committee gave me a pretty good background on national security. Um, after uh, doing some consulting and making some um, some money off my expertise, I came back into government in 2017 um, as I was asked and ultimately uh, nominated and appointed to be the Assistant Secretary of Defense. Uh, for the largest real estate portfolio in the world and all the, all the energy and environmental programs that goes along with that. Um, my first uh, meeting and my first interaction with then Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis, was a very, included a very direct request. Um, and he was very succinct and clear. He was all, all the connected technologies we have in our society and our nation um, that we're adopting by the day more, millions more, right. because it does not make us any less safe or secure. He goes, as a matter of fact, um, I'm concerned about it. Um, and then he leaned in about a foot away from my face, and it was a one-on-one -on -one <laughs> meeting. And he says, fix it. And I'm like, okay. Fix right, it. Boss, I got that clear. Got and it. I go, uh, how long do I have? He goes, you got six months. And I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, so uh, <laughs> you know, did it's you fix funny. it? You, yeah. No, I haven't. So uh, <laughs> I, I failed miserably. Um, but if you go back and look at the 2018 uh, National Defense Strategy, it's specifically written in there. Um, that uh, our our national security strategy needs to realize that the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. Right. That any ad adversary, whether it be a terrorist or a nation state, has the ability to uh, ultimately impact our way of life here in the United States right. yeah. um, by a cyber attack or, or, or a connected technology. So, uh, so and that's re more real than it's ever been. Um, and it's something that we need to address as a nation. So uh, I took that guidance from the Secretary of Defense very seriously. Yeah. Um, spent some time with the National Security Agency and Cybercom, and you know, got the got the bejeebers scared out of me of what <laughs> could actually happen. Yeah. Um, and then uh, one good thing when you're in Assistant Security Defense and you call a meeting, people show up. Um, so on a snowy uh, Friday afternoon, called in um, some of the leading manufacturers of control systems. Right. And believe it or not, uh, it's not a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so we're talking, you know, the world of Johnson Controls, uh, Schneider Electric, Rockwell, Honeywell, um, and and a few others. Um, and we started asking ourselves, okay, how collectively do we address this issue of a growing um, insecurity and growing threat to safety posed by smart control systems? Sure. And, uh, you know, that group um, of OEMs has, you know, has a had a, a tendency to not want to cooperate because, you know, they're they're the ones producing it. But on the other hand, I, I really give them credit. They say, yes, let's dig in and solve this problem. So um, so ultimately, we formed a working group um, that became uh, eventually a nonprofit in 2020 called Building Cybersecurity. So to answer your question with a very long answer. <laughs> I am now the CEO of Building Cybersecurity, which is a nonprofit um, entity um, that we that was created specifically to create, uh, to establish uh, performance frameworks for how we design, install, uh, integrate, and ultimately uh, operate connected operational technologies um, and to mitigate the cyber risk um, that is uh, ultimately inherent in them. That's awesome. You know, th this space is, is it's so the Wild West that we're we're in the, the frontier of needing to incorporate all these these things we've been doing in IT that we just haven't done in OT. Like we in IT, we build systems that are secure from beginning. We design them as secure. A lot of these OT systems have been around for 40 and 50 years and they, they security wasn't even a concept, much less designed into the architecture. So talk if you don't mind, talk a little bit about. How how do you approach something so vast from from architectures that's that designed forty years ago to new things that are get, being put in tomorrow? Like how do you bridge that gap? Because you can't just go replace it all. So so how do we how do we approach this big problem? 
Well, it starts, uh, you know, uh, by, by way of background, I'm an architect by training, which uh, to all the engineers in the world, we're an arrogant bunch. And then being from Philadelphia, there's an arrogance there. Um, and then, you know, and so when you see, so you got to start by being arrogant. You got to start sure. by saying, okay, we, you know, somebody has to, has an idea to change the world. Yeah. And so, and so really that's kind of what we've done here in BCS is, is we're going to take on a, a gigantic issue. Yeah. Cybersecurity is a, is a huge issue. Uh, the protection of technologies is even a bigger issue. Yeah. And one of the first things we did, we realized this is not necessarily a cybersecurity issue. This is a cyber safety. This is a human yeah. safety issue. Think about this, Aaron. You know, a car these days, if you can get one because there's a chip shortage, right. has anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 microchips in it. Right. To include some um, some chips and processors that 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 manage critical systems in a car. Um, and we're living with this threat. Any 17 year old kid with a laptop can can do some terrible things to a car. Yeah, absolutely. And yet we yet we don't have a dashboard light that says, "Hey, someone's messing with your data. You need to pull over." Yeah. So so really, it starts with um, convincing a lot of people that we need to design cyber safety into anything: a car, your home, right? You know, a building, you know, a water treatment plant, you know, um, you know, a, you know, a, a, a rail line. I mean. We have to get. We have to start asking ourselves, what are we deliberately doing to reduce cyber risk? Um, and that's really what the nonprofit is working on. What can we do, not just on an assessment and a certification, sure, but ultimately, how do we drive better design requirements in anything? Your smart TV, your smart coffee maker. What can we do to ensure that that device that's in your home? Um, does not ultimately pose a risk to you, and I'm more I'm more worried about uh, not sorry someone stealing my data. Sure. I'm worried about actually someone using um, a camera that I've installed in my home and be able to look into my home and creating fear or creating a physical condition where someone can know when you're gone and actually you know, you know rob the place. So 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 we see in our in our organization a a a compelling concern to get in front of it before we start seeing property damage and 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 casualty and folks actually getting hurt. Um, and so that from us is a, is a very compelling statement that drives a lot of interest when you start talking safety, particularly now if you're looking at an incentive that insurance companies can bring in um, that are also concerned about rising claims, not just in cyber insurance, but what could ultimately happen in property and casualty claims as a result of an OT cyber attack. Yeah, I mean, OT is really bridging that gap of I'm not just worried about a light turning on and off. I can I can hurt people. I can spin things up. I can explode things. I can crash a car. I can I can do a lot of things that are different in IT. I lose my email or my my web server goes down or yeah I mean maybe it makes me lose some fun or or the FAA can go down look <laughs> I mean it can or the Colonial Pipeline can go down that's right I mean so we are I mean I would never call the Colonial Pipeline an OT attack because sure. uh, I'm, I'm I want to be true to my profession that definitely was an IT ransomware attack but what 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 the you know the folks at dark side never bothered to do is they never asked themselves and by the way they had a bad day you know and we'll talk I could talk about that in a minute but. When that pipeline was, uh, was a decision by the CEO to shut down the pipeline, partially because he was moving product for free. Yeah. But more importantly, they did not know how far into the OT from the billing system to the meters to the to right. the valves, how far they'd gone in. That creates now an, an, a huge environmental threat or sure. a human safety threat. Um, so when we start talking about ransomware attacks to your IT, yeah. um, there's going to be a physical impact. And, you know, I'm I'm one of those few maybe in the country that suspects maybe that FAA shutdown on January 11th may not necessarily have been some contractor, um, you know, deciding that that they somehow you know, pulled a couple of codes out and all of a sudden the system went down. I deleted um, at something. the same Oops. time it was happening in Canada, exact right. same time. Right. Um, yeah. To me, it's way too coincidental. Yeah. So we are starting to see even IT attacks have a physical impact. And that's right. That's really what we're trying to address within our nonprofit. How do we how do we mitigate that threat? Well, and and there's no clear line anymore. You know, I, I saw a recent uh, uh, post on on LinkedIn, and they were saying, "Was this an OT attack or was this an IT attack?" At the end of the day, does it really matter? The Colonial Pipeline, like it wasn't really an OT attack, but at the end of the day, they didn't know if they had it further, so they had to shut things down because it could have been, and yeah. and, and it ultimately doesn't matter. Was it on the control system? No. But it was on a system that they were billing, which means they had to turn it off. And 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 ultimately, it impacted OT. It impacted the thing that I'm selling, and I couldn't do that anymore, not safely. So I had to shut it down. And mm -hmm. you know, I have I have examples of, 
you know, at a power plant and we're doing an upgrade on, on unit one and unit two is, is offline. And, and, and when unit one is running and unit two is offline, we're doing work on one of them and something happens on the other unit. Well, the operator punches the unit out because they can't see what's going on. They're driving right. blind. Now yeah. it wasn't a bad actor. It wasn't a cyber attack, but still it something that we were doing on one side impacted the other and the operator did what they had to. They punched the unit out because that's what they're trained to do. The plant yeah. was running fine. The PLCs, everything was doing what it's supposed to do, but they had no visibility of what was going on. So of course they punched it out. And, and we're going to see that more and more and more as these things start coming to light. Um, how many of these things are, are, are going on that we don't know the TSA, the colonial pipeline, et cetera. Right. Yeah, and and look, I think you know for for the folks who are listening in, I mean, we it, it, you know a basic understanding IT, all the software, all the all the data systems are in place. OT, it's really anything that can take a virtual command and turn into a physical action. Your wireless right. thermostat um, in your home is a perfect example. You're on your iPhone, you go ahead and adjust your temperature. It has a physical action. Yep. And so it's all connected. And 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 look, I'm I think for you and I, Aaron, we're the probably the last people that want to discourage innovation. Sure. We do want an automated society. We do want to be able to off our phones, uh, you know, be able to manipulate um, the environment around, around us in a positive way. Um, so in no way am I discouraging the, the dissegregation sure. of IT and OT or, or, the, or, or no longer putting smart systems in your, in your home or in your car. All we're saying is this is the future and we're adding more. And when we start relying more on robotics, we start more relying more on, on automated processes all around us, you know, now to the point where you can go to mcdonald's and it's all automated yeah um i mean you know okay that might not work great for a workforce but bottom line it works good for mcdonald's i'm not saying don't do that all we're saying is when you do that you have to design cyber safety into it and that has to be the beginning and acknowledging they're connected where what can you do to either create a sensor system or some type of anomaly detection or something that says hey your ot is being used for something that it was not intended to be used for, and and therefore uh, somebody needs to check it out. So so how do you how do you see and and how are you getting response from the marketplace? So a lot of the people that you're you're building building management, you know, commercial real estate, uh, you know, things that are managing things in buildings. How how are you seeing their their responsiveness to to this? And are do they have funding for it? Like, are, do they have teams? Like, how does it look for them? And how are they responding to it? Yeah. So a lot of the work uh, that we put into the nonprofit came out with some frustration that I had in the Department of Defense. So we spent years saying, hey, we got a problem with our OT. Right. Yet it was really difficult uh, for funding. And no mission owner and no CEO wants to spend money on risk mitigation, you know, when they can spend money on growing their brand, growing their products, actually sure. making more money. Yeah. So uh, so from us, the reason why I kind of turned away from federal government towards um, uh, the uh, the civil sector First of all, the threat's so much more compelling. If you look at the rest of our, our society, what we rely on, more importantly is there is potentially an incentive there, and that is through the insurance market, um, right. that that you do need a return on investment. And no, I mean, we've got CISOs that are losing their hair right now. You know, one's yeah. even going to jail. You know, we've got CISOs around the country who are jumping up and down saying, hey, we need to spend money on this. It's really difficult for a CFO, CFO to C, CEO to justify it unless... They can't get insurance. Um, right. so they can no longer get insurance, which we're starting to see in the cyber insurance world a little bit. Um, some of the traditional players are saying, "Hey, we're not going to touch this market anymore because the risk is just too high." Um, uh, and and so I think that for us, uh, and we're seeing this crest right about the time where ransomware attacks are going through the roof. Um, we're starting to see a you know greater concern about where is their client risk. We're starting to see insurers proactively say. Hey, for in order for us to give you an insurance policy, you have to do the following things. Right. Number one, multi-factor uh, multi authentication. Sure. And if you don't do that, we will not honor your claims. That's that's pretty good. I mean, I, and I think so we're starting to see some progress there. Now, what we've done with the BCS is turn into a performance framework where it's not an audit coming in once a year or coming in one every year. It's real-time data that's being accumulated by a company that ultimately can be fed to an insurance company if they want it. Um, sure. To assure that the programs are in place that were set that were determined at the beginning are are operating effectively, we in order to demonstrate this model, and I know it's a long. I keep giving you long answers. I'm sorry. No, it's good. That. Perfect. We we 
our nonprofit is built um, for multiple sectors. Sure. And we've built a framework um, around a global standard uh, called ISA 62443. Yep. For us o uh, OT nerds, everybody knows what 62443 is. It's it's a pretty good program. And we are, we are partner with the International Society of Automation on taking that framework and wrapping a performance framework around that. Sure. Um, it's a pretty complicated framework too. It's mainly built for oil and gas. Right. Um, so what we've done is we've built a series of vertical sectors, water, healthcare, robotics, industrial controls. But our first sector is commercial real estate. And, and there's three reasons for that. First of all, easiest set of controls to, to map. Um, sure. It's just basic building systems. So we start out as coward. Just start with the ground floor. And work, <laughs> start with the easy and then up. move to the hard. Yep. Yeah. That they, look, in, insurance companies will love to have us gone straight to industrial ICS, but we're sure. like, no, 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 no. We're going to start it. But, but more importantly, you're dealing with an industry, which is the building industry that is relatively, um, I would say, immature on their cybersecurity protections. They don't know that all this smart technology they're putting in their buildings, it potentially could create a risk. Right, um, and then are also sit at about thirty-seven trillion dollars with assets around the world with a significant um, um, property and casualty exposure and insurance exposure. I keep using right. P and C. Yeah. Um, so we felt like that would be the first market to test. Um, but you're right. I, uh, I think uh, as I've been going around in the country, and I really do appreciate this podcast uh, for the last year and a half, and I and I and I expose or I raise awareness on the cybersecurity threat. The first thing we get from building owners or operators is, "I wish you wouldn't have told me that," no, because <laughs> now, because now I've got to act on it. Yeah. But then they're like, "Heck, I don't came and spell cybersecurity. What do I do?" So really, what we're saying is, okay, yes, the threat's real, um, but here's a framework that's easy to use. That all you have to do is, I want to be cyber bronze, cyber silver, cyber gold, based on what I'm willing to invest and what my risk is, and we'll take care of the rest. Right. That's actually attractive to a building owner and operator thing. I don't have to go find my own vendors. I just say, okay, I want cyber silver. And the group comes in and gives them cyber silver. Sure. I um, mean, so the framework at its core are these capabilities um, that start with designs and then ultimately instru instruction, but also how you operate the building and safeguard it, patch it, you know, uh, monitor it. Um, so that's where you get to the different levels. And so we're, we're making it attractive and easy to use for an industry that's immature. It has been slow, um, but we are starting to see some adoption with some of the more progressive CTOs um, and these portfolio owners who see the value, the, the need to protect their value of their assets by investing in an in industry derived standard. I need to make sure. that clear. We're not derived from government. Right. We are a, a consortium of competing, competing companies who've come together and saying, here's what you need to do for cyber safety. Really powerful because we have a lot of companies involved. Um, and so this industry standard is what a asset owner can turn to as opposed to company X saying, hey, we have a secret sauce. You need us. And then company Y saying the same thing. So we're coming in saying, here are the capabilities you need. Right. And by the way, our members can fulfill those capabilities. Well, and it's more than just a technology because we know I can go buy a, a, any technology off the shelf, but the technology in and of itself is almost useless. Like it, It's like buying, you know, the best woodworking tools in the world and putting them in my garage. But if I don't know how to use them and I don't go out there and do it, it's not, they're not going to build anything for me. I've got to take that and build processes and understand how to use it and where to place it and what its purpose is to really get the full utilization and capabilities and, and value out of, out of those tool sets. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. Yeah. And that's in that, and that we do have a comprehensive training program and it's not just a certification initial training. What are you, do, what are you training on as the cyber threat evolves? Right. That this is that we're not talking electricity or fire in a building. We're talking about a constantly evolving threat. Um, and, and the biggest complaint that I get from building owners and operators is, Hey, what's cyber silver this year is not going to be what cyber silver is next year. You, you're moving the goalposts on us. Right. I'm like, no, I'm responding to the evolving threat and new companies, you know, that, that come up with a new capability that sure. we determine to be significant enough that we need to put in our framework. Yeah. Um, so, so we are, we do, uh, we are made a conscious decision to be industry developed and industry run uh, because of the fact that we want to stay on top of the best practices that are emerging every month. Yeah. It's, it's not a static thing. You can't just put it in and say, I'm good. It's like a, a a fitness you know routine. I can't go to the gym one time and say I've checked that box. I'm good. I don't have to ever do that again. Yeah, 
Yeah. And, and you have to maintain readiness. I mean, there are That's some right. cyber capabilities out there that not a lot of folks know. You can actually have an OT range of your building now where you can practice. You right. can actually see, you know, where there might be some, you know, some unguarded remote access points, and you can actually practice how quickly you can respond. So, so there are there are capabilities emerging every day um, that actually give us, uh, you know, a better posture. The key is how do you pull it all together and then present it to someone who doesn't understand cybersecurity in a way that, like, okay, I, I want that. And I'm not sure exactly everything it's doing, but I trust the industry, and I and I and that's what I want to put in my uh, in to protect my asset. So, so beyond tools and, and technologies, again, let's say that the, the building owner, they own a, a group of buildings, but they don't have an IT group. They don't have an OT group. So do y'all offer services and companies that can come in and run it for them, deploy it for them, manage it for them, and give them a report that says, hey, here, you're good? Yeah, so that's our that's our our plan. And I say plan because of the fact we're relatively young. Uh, sure. our, we took about a year uh, with some of the best OT experts in the country and comprised in part by companies and others who are just interested yeah. to build this framework. So this framework is less than a year old. Gotcha. And then we've tested it in a series of buildings that um, uh, from members of our of our of our nonprofit who said, yeah, I want to give you three buildings to test this. Sure. So that was we've been doing that this past summer. Now we're doing a cyber commissioning uh, from one of our members of DCS for a high-rise building in Boston. So we're starting to see folks want want this to succeed, um, but we're still in the we're still at, um, in the stages of transitioning from of having a framework that can be used in an assessment. Now we're uh, our goals in twenty three are to build out a, a a a really solid managed services to be able to meet to meet each uh, uh, section. We have companies that can do preliminary assessments and, and some certifications. We want to make it formalized. And that's our that's our growth strategy for 23. And then tying that to the insurance that you talked about, that, yeah. that gives that gives the owners a, a financial goal and reason to do these things. It's not just a cost center. I can actually help out my bottom line by doing this, transferring some of that risk off and not owning all of that. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And and look what, you know, a lot of um, uh, owners, operators, managers are doing. They're transferring that risk to a third party provider, but don't necessarily know what they're getting. Right. So, as you know, in life, there's three things and this. We, we do this personally. You know, when we buy home home insurance or car insurance, there's three sure. things you do in life. You you assume risk, which is how much you pay for limits. Yep. You transfer it or you mitigate it. Yeah. Um, and so our goal is to say, hey, here is a way to mitigate the threat. Um, that gives you a more favorable posture as you're going in and negotiate uh, either cyber insurance or property and housing insurance. It's kind of like what you and I do, and I'm, I'm maybe not you. I don't want to accuse you, but you know what I do <laughs> when I buy a homeowner's policy, and you know, there's a little block. Hey, do you have a physical security system? And right. I look down, check my dots in, you know, my 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 little dog. I'm like, yeah, I got a security system. That's right. You check that block. You get a discount on your on your home insurance, right? right. Um, or or car, for car insurance, you put a chip in your car, which I'll never do because I'm a right. speeder. Um, but then you can say, hey, you're a good driver. You get a discount on car insurance. Right. So there are there are processes in place already in our society for re rewarding good behavior. Um, so the goal is how can we apply that uh, to cyber safety within a building? Yeah, and I, I've gotten a lot of feedback and talked to a lot of insurance folks, um, and they're just really struggling on how do they insure this. They see it as a marketplace, they see it as a need, but it's so risky and it's so un. It's the wild west, like we said before. How do they do this while giving a service to their client without charging ridiculous rates? Because the only way they can judge, you know, judge the risk if they don't have any defined and 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 clarity into what what they're insuring is to jack the prices up. Well, the more yeah. clarity you can get in these environments and the safer they can be and understand that risk and categorize it, then they can start bringing prices down and getting more clarity around what they're covering and, and what, what they pay out for. And you have more confidence as a, as a, as a policy owner that when I buy this policy, if something happens, then they're going to actually pay because I've done what they told me to. Yeah. And, and you just described exactly what we're trying to disrupt as yeah. rates go up, not just for cyber, but for property and casualty. Yeah. What we want to offer is, okay, spend, instead of spending money on those exorbitant rates, mitigate the threat. Actually sure. spend money on, on, on knocking out your, you know, your unauthorized remote access ports. Right. You know, not, actually reduce the vector, the threat of vectors and attack, and then re-engage um, your insurance company for a lower rate. So I, I, I personally would rather spend money on mitigation than transfer. 
Sure. Uh, but then again, I'm I'm not running a multi billion dollar you know real estate company. But but the goal is that to be able to in, interject into that risk decision, you know, a viable way to mitigate. Yeah. Yeah. And and either way, at the end of the day, it's it's improving your bottom line and helping you transfer or mitigate that risk so that it's not on me. Uh, eventually, it's going to help um, property valuations. I saw, you know, right now, when you value a property, you're not necessarily valuing the 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 risk posed by the OT in that building. Sure. Uh, but but the goal here is a, a look, an apartment building get hits with a cyber attack where the elevators all of a sudden, you know, and, and they're not going to drop and hurt somebody. But if just just the fear that they've been seized, yeah, um, you know, what does that do to the value of that apartment building overnight? I mean, yeah. not in not in months or years, but like, yeah. okay, you know, yeah. we have to evacuate the building, and you don't want to tell anybody why. And then it, then all of a sudden, rumor starts going around because it was a cyber attack. Um, that value of that building uh, is going to be significantly impacted. I think folks are starting to wake up to that. Yeah, I, I actually have my real estate license here in Texas, and uh, I've had it since 2006. And I remember in my classes, one of the things that came up was if somebody dies in the house, or if uh, if they, you know, if anybody says the house is haunted, even if you don't believe in that, you have to disclose that. Just because you know the the neighbors may you know egg the house or whatever, because you didn't tell them that it was the haunted house of the neighborhood, then yeah. that's on you as a as a real estate agent. You didn't disclose that information, so you're breaking. Yeah, I'm your laughing at that duty. because I actually benefited from a haunted house where nobody else wanted to move in, and I got yeah. a really cheap rent, and and and. <laughs> It definitely was haunted. That was confirmed, um, awesome. but I didn't have a problem with them. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, so what are, what are some of the, how do you transfer? So, you know, you tackle this, this building thing. What is next after you do the building security? What is the next vertical you think you'll go out? Yeah. So uh, we've been asked uh, really what I see as a risk in this country is water systems. Um, yeah. The grid utilities are doing a a pretty good job through their critical critical infrastructure protection standards. I mean, they have a definitely a bottom line requirement to keep the power on. Yep. Um, so for as much as a lot of folks in the country worry about the grid, I'm more worried about water systems, which is an under commoditized uh, market. We all need water and we're paying for it cheaply. And unfortunately that cheap price, which we all love does not necessarily allow for investments in cyber protection. So sure. um, uh, I am de- actively reaching out uh, to the control system manufacturers who are heavy in the water space saying, hey, help us create a, a nationwide industry standard um, that can that can provide some some guidance to some of you know, 55,000 water systems around the country. OK, what do I need to do today? What do I need tomorrow? And look, what's really scary, you know, Aaron, we've already, we've had water system attacks. You know, the yeah. Omar uh, water system in Florida and right around the Super Bowl in 2021. Yeah. That could have really hurt people if somebody yeah. had not been watching that lie level. That actually could have really poisoned a lot of folks. So so the, the threat's real. Um, it's it's scary because how easily it can be done. So really the growth of BCS is as we mature the 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 model, and it's a business model. We have definitely have to make the insurance case. As we mature that, then we then we want to use our you know our the value we've gained uh, to quickly start ascending. Um, at one point, I thought we could do work in hospitals, but man, um, um, truly mapping cyber safety within a hospital, particularly with all the innovation and in operating equipment, imaging equipment, yeah, it's going to be tough. So right now, we're going to hit water systems and then and, and then industrial ICS is the next level. So, so you talked about uh, it, your your career. You've done a lot of policy stuff on on the Fed side, and and you just talked about regulation, how well that's doing, in, in you know the the grid. How much does regulation come into these verticals and pushing some of this requirements down on wastewaters and building management and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so you can tell I'm a government guy because I came out, you know, from government and decided to start a a cybersecurity nonprofit, which I've been told a hundred times is about the stupidest idea anybody's ever heard of. <laughs> uh, but uh, but given my uh, my government experience, look, I I um, my hats off to what Sis and the team have tried to do over there. But look, eighty percent of the of the nation's infrastructure is owned by the private sector. Yeah. Um. I I and and if you look at SIP. Um, you know, there are some utilities that are actually walked away from SIP uh, because they're not moving fast enough. The standards not being updated fast enough. And there are power companies that have actually paid a fine instead of complying with SIP. Yeah. So um, I'll be honest with you. I am not a fan of regulation. I'm not a fan of building codes. Uh, I believe that the industry can drive change through a, 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 a thoughtful approach to what should be a nationwide standard. And industry is much more flexible and adaptable to update that standard. You know, to get it to get a change to NIST, and I'm using terms here, I'm hoping everybody understands. 
to get it changed to NIST requires two or three years of deliberation yeah. um, and, and SIP same way. Yeah. Um, so, so you really need to have an organization that's informed by NIST, informed by ISA, informed by these other frameworks, but then ultimately can take um, rapidly evolving industry best practices and put it to work for the folks who really need it. So that that's our business model. Um, yeah, I I I, uh, I I do believe that you know um, there is a role for government, uh, particularly in in maintaining the urgency, um, and that's why I go back to the concern I have with the FAA attack. If that was a cyber attack, you know the federal government owes uh, owes the country, you know, because they're asking for mandatory reporting requirements for major right. cyber incidents. To be honest about it, yeah, and so we can address it collectively and move beyond it. Um, so uh, I, I, for as much as I'm reluctant on government reporting and major cyber incidents, it does drive a greater awareness. Um, so, so I think that's the role government can play to some sure. degree. Um, but there has to be um, a balance, which has been emphasized by this administration and previous administrations about that public-private partnership, that collaboration, uh, which I think it's going to be more private than public sure. about truly getting after standards that will move the needle. Yeah, and and that's the other piece I've heard a lot is is the ability to to pick up the phone and call the bat phone and and call an agency, call the government, and say, hey, we think we may have had an incident, and have a response team come out and help us, give us guidance on what to do, what's next step, without the impact or without the worry that they're going to slap my hand, I'm going to get in trouble for it. Like at the end of the day, we want everybody to raise their hand and say, hey, something's going on here, and somebody needs to take a look at this because I don't know what's going on. We're taking we're taking action. But we need to make sure that others have learned from it, that, that that we get this knowledge and value out of what we've got to everybody else so we don't have it repeat over and over and over again. Yeah, and and and, and some of that's good. Uh, how how responsive that local FBI team could be, that local right. team. I mean, you look, it's ultimately the, the liability still rests with the you know, person who's being attacked. Absolutely. Um, I mean, perfect case on point. I mean, you'll probably have uh, any federal agency don't pay the ransom. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're running a pipeline and all of a sudden you're moving product for free and you're potentially got an environmental catastrophe in your hands, you're paying the ransom. Yeah. Um, because of the fact that uh, it, there's a lot more at stake than, than than government policy there. Yep. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, government does have a role to play. It definitely serves, should serve as a first responder. You know, I'm still laughing uh, because of the fact, you know, we've been dealing in, in our homes with cyber attacks for the last 20 years. I mean, how many folks in home have their camera covered up? Yep. Or how many folks like myself or my mom have experienced that green screen of death where, yep. you know, all of a sudden you get that, you know, that image pops up and saying, hey, we've locked your software, you know, pay somebody in a Nigerian cafe $5,000. <laughs> and what do you do for 20 years? You don't call the FBI, or call police, nope. you like pull the plug, um, you say a prayer, you know, you, you shut down your system right away, you say a prayer that it reboots up and nine times out of 10 it does, yeah. or you call Geek Squad you know, and, and, and get it fixed. So we, yeah. we've we never really had for 20 years in our homes, you know, any type of way to have a public entity respond to us. Yeah. Um. So there's a limited uh, effectiveness of that. Um. And, and so what we do is we ended up buying, we buy um, Norton or McAfee. We buy, yep. we buy our own protection on a subscription basis every year, which is an aftermarket add on, yep. you know, that, that is another entity kind of like what we're doing at BCS only for it that serves as a protection mechanism. Sure. And it's not, and there's no guarantee. No. So when you have a cyber, you know, if you have your IT system hacked after you have McAfee or CrowdStrike or anything installed, it's not that you can call them and saying, hey, I paid for this. What happened? Um, because that that's not the way it's set up. No. So so unfortunately, we are left our own devices. There's only so much government can do in the response because it's happening everywhere in our yeah. homes and our workplaces. It's million. We could set up an entire industry of responders. Um, and I'm not so sure what it would do other than give us some confidence that we're, we're making the right steps. So we've still got a long way to go on government investments and how far do we offer our citizens um, some type of, of assistance or, or protection. So on, on the government side, how much do you think they're aware at the top level, at the places that need to be? How big the risk is across all these verticals? Again, I, I, I'm sure they get a lot of focus and focus on the grid and focus on, you know, power generation and all that kind of stuff. But how much are they thinking about wastewater? How much are they thinking about building security? Uh, well, you're, first of all, let's talk to me and uh, talk about me. I mean, once I got that NSA brief and that cyber brief, I couldn't sleep for like five years. I mean, right. I do wake up every morning thanking God the power is still on. Yeah. Um, so there is a compelling threat. Um, and there, And we are doing a damn good job of defending our nation. 
Um, but you still have programs like Shields Up, you know, that was put out by the uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security uh, Agency, CISA, yeah. within the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and they, they, they're they putting out some pretty compelling warnings um, yeah. to critical infrastructure operators and owners that the threat's real, you know, and, and whether it be from um, Russia or China or Iran or North Korea, look, I'm worried about um, none of those. I'm worried about the person who doesn't care, you know, the, yeah. the cyber terrorist that doesn't care what he, who he hurts. Yeah. You know, um, you know we're, we're keeping Russia at bay partially by playing with their systems to say, Hey, if you want to attack us, guess what? You're going down. Yeah. Um, but you can't do that with some, you know, some terrorist that's sitting somewhere, you know, anywhere and, and yeah. can use a keyboard to create a problem. So, uh, so I think we do have some protections in place. Uh, I think we just need to be more uh, uh, dig- diligent and invest. We, we definitely need to understand that, uh, you know, a cyber attack can alter our way of life tomorrow. You know, I'm, I'm, I understand we're putting a lot of money into climate change these days. You know, but but look, that that may hap- happen. You know, that may have an impact on us in twenty years, fifty years, or or sixty years. A cyber attack could happen and will have a devastating impact on our society tomorrow. Yeah, I mean that, and that is why uh, you know I think we need to look at our priorities in this country and where do, what is the greatest threat facing us, and how quickly you know can we invest to mitigate that threat. Lots of doom and gloom, but, but at the end, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm offering a solution. No, absolutely. No, I mean, right. it, it's, it's easy to hear from a, from a cyber perspective, all the bad things, but, but I've heard you talk about all of the good things and all the things that we're doing and, and opportunities and a path out. Like it's not hard. Like nothing we're talking about is, is all that difficult. It's basic stuff. It we needs just to be deliberate. Do it it, it, it does, it, right? And if, if you design cyber safety from the beginning, you don't even spend that much more. Right. You know, whether it be a car, a home, a building, a stadium, you could design it in and, and you you actually can have a pretty effective mitigation strategy in place at almost no cost. You just have to dr- drive those requirements to the left and the design process. So we're not creating more problems for ourselves. So how much of that, and, and so that's a good point, right? Is is a lot of these systems are not, as we talked earlier, they're not designed with security in mind. Even today, this is twenty. Even the internet wasn't designed with security in mind. Go no, but, but today, why is there any system that doesn't have cybersecurity as one of the critical things before it's deployed a, as a line item? And I, and I know partly the answer is cost and the people that are buying it don't want to pay for it, et cetera, but it shouldn't even be an option anymore, should it? Yeah, well, and that and that's you're right. I mean, that's you know we're we're adopt we adopt technology and then we go we do an oh, oh crap you know factor about halfway through. Hey, we yeah. created a problem for ourselves. Um. So so yes, I mean I mean we have to do that. And and look, I you know one of the things I was also told by the Secretary of Defense is stop admiring the damn problem and find solutions. <laughs> I mean I, I I will say and it, it is frustrating. There are a lot of folks these days who are getting paid to continue to talk about the problem. Yeah. Without necessarily you know getting in the dirt and in the blood and the sweat and coming up with a solution and then yep. trying to and trying to make that solution national. So. Sure. Um, yeah, you look, there's a lot of companies saying, hey, you need to hire us. You need to have our product because of right. the fact that, you know, there's a there's a threat out there. Um, and I and I appreciate that because they do offer value. Sure. Um, but we, we we truly have to get at a more holistic solution, you know, and and, and, and a, a commitment across all of uh, both industry and commercial side that we we will start designing cyber safe systems. I mean, my smart TV behind me, you know, I, I start, I start working on BCS all of somehow my control panel burns up in my brand new smart TV. <laughs> I mean, it, it was not by accident. So, so we, we, we have a threat and we just, we have to acknowledge it and then deliberately mitigate. So how much of this is, is awareness? Like, so I know that people in general understand they've heard of cyber stuff on the news, but if they're not an IT guy or an OT guy, like you or me, it may come in one ear and out the other or worst case scenario. Hey, that happens to somebody else. Like it, it's not going to happen to me, whatever. Right. So how do we get that into more people and and understand without scaring? It's not trying to scare tactic, but really let them understand what the risks are and, and awareness in general. Like not everybody's going to listen to this podcast because, you know, the people that are going to listen to this are going to be OT people, IT people, technology people, you know, C-suite executives are going to be people that know about this pro- this this problem already. But how does the rest of the world get a better understanding of why this is a problem? And it's not just something you see on CNN and MSNBC that's just trying to scare you to get a click on a, on a link or whatever, right? Yeah, I mean, look, that's, you know, that's what you know, I'm frustrated right now that what we're doing within building cybersecurity is, is not moving fast enough. Um, 
And I think, uh, first of all, I'm a little bit concerned about you saying not folks to listen to your podcast. I think this is fantastic. <laughs> you do a great job. So I'm really do hoping you go national with this. Um, but uh, but look, I think we have to look at it as a safety issue. Um, right. Cybersecurity and IT, you know, the IT threat, ransomware attacks don't threaten people or cause property damage. So I really uh, do believe that once we start addressing cyber safety as a cultural, the way we look at safety across society, I mean, you know, insurance drives building owners to get that ice off the stairs, you know, yeah. every winter. You yeah. Know, so because it's a safety concern. Sure. So so I do believe that um, there is a term that needs to become very prevalent and that's cyber safety and the culture that goes behind that, uh, because that will, I think, will drive a deliberate attempt to design safety in virtually. Yeah. Um, and 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 really, once we start saying, hey, look, this is not your data. This is not your potentially your bank accounts. This is, you know, you could get hurt yeah. or you could or there could be fear in your home because some virtually somebody's in your home um, or or you can, you know, you can have your car go out of control. I mean, there, there are things here that once we start looking at it from a safety perspective, we really should have called ourselves building cyber safety, not cyber security. I, I kick myself on the head every day for that. <laughs> Um, but uh, but but bottom line is, I think once we start looking at that, people will start paying attention. Now, I, I will say, I mean, uh, the, this the, um, the current administration has done a great job. I mean, I, we haven't brought up the fact that Security Exchange Commission is, is requiring now filings for yep. cyber governance, cyber programs, cyber investments. So we're starting to see, you know, a, a growing interest. Um, but the key is, how do we say, OK, this is something I have to do? This is to, to this is something I want to do, but I don't want to hurt anybody. Yeah. That is where we, that's the magic Rubicon we have to cross um, as far as wanting to do it because I care about the person next to me and I don't want to create a problem. Yeah, you know, growing up in power utility, so you know, you see the hard hats behind me. You know, safety was was a, a requirement. It wasn't optional. I couldn't show up to the power plant without wearing my steel toe boots, my hard hat. All my PPE was required. If I went to a substation, there was you know fire retardant clothing, all that kind of stuff, right? safety cyber was never considered part of that safety system. So including yeah. it in safety, because at the end of the day, it is part of the safety system. In fact, a lot of the safety systems are some of the things that we've had cyber incidents on that we've removed that safety system. That's protecting our, you know, life and limb. Um, so that, that pushes people to say, this is not optional anymore. I have to yeah. do this. And, and, you know, that goes back to the CIA triad of, of cyber, right. Is confidentiality, well, in, in OT, it's really around availability. And, and and I always like to say availability slash safety, because it's really that availability and safety is really all, all that's what we're focused on in OT and manufacturing, critical infrastructure, yep. our plants. I care more about that plant being available and not hurting someone than I care about the proprietary way that I run it or the data that's on my system. I don't care about that. You can have that. There's nothing that I'm trying to protect there. For the most part, mainly it's around keeping the system available and and my people around it and whoever the service is providing safe. Yeah, I agree. And look, and, and the way you respond to a OT incident has to be fundamentally different from how you yeah. respond to an IT because an IT system is okay. Let's go ahead and isolate the system. Let's right. you know let's figure out where we have it. OT is okay. You know, am I does, is somebody at risk? Yeah. I mean, so so the the basic questions coming in the immediate aftermath of a discovery of an OT attack are. Can somebody get hurt? Right. And in, and that drives a whole different response mechanism than you would have to an IT attack. And unfortunately, we're using the same protocol to respond to an OT attack. Now, it, 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 and 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 it, and, it, and it creates risk. Sure. So so I'm I have a huge pet peeve about you know about there needs to be a separate protocol starting from the first ten seconds when you see an OT attack. And 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 we built our framework around life, safety, health as the highest priority. Uh, for what you have to design in for cyber for for cyber protections, so so you know, you know I'm glad we're having this conversation. We need to let the world know that an OT attack, you really have got to look at different things from an IT attack. And and uh, and you know I've always been bothered by you know the folks you know who say, hey, we've had a thousand days without a safety incident. Right. Why do we need a safety program? Right. You know, it, it's because it, because the incidents are so remote. And the answer is because because you've had a great safety program that you, you have to keep maintain. <laughs> I mean, so and it's just incredible how people are saying, well, there hasn't been that many OT attacks. Therefore, why do we need to spend money in OT protections? And and, and you're like, yeah, but the potential is so catastrophic. You, know, you, you want you want to spend money to prevent that. 
Um, and so we continue to have to fight these questions and, 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 and offer some, you know, some good advice on the last thing in the world you want to be responsible for is killing somebody or hurt it or, or causing property damage. And that's yeah. really what needs to drive it. And, and it's, it's funny too, because you look at an OT event and, and again, I go back to power generations, what I spent a lot of my career in, um, you know, when, when a plant trips, a, a turbine trips or whatever, the operators immediately jump in. They know they have this procedure. They know what they're doing. They're trying to get the unit back online. They want to get it running availability, availability, making sure safety is again, part of that conversation, but they're never even looking at, was this a cyber event? Was yeah. there something that gone on? What caused this thing to trip off? They just want to make sure that I can start it back up safely and it's not going to damage equipment and hurt people. And as long as I can do that, get it back online. And Oh, Aaron, I mean, you're, hit, you're, you're hitting a sweet spot for me because you're right. Uh, when an HVAC control panel goes down, you know, I, I grew up as a military engineer in the Air Force. You know, sure. we, sent a, we sent a team out there. They look at it. They see if it's under warranty to put a new panel in. You know, when that burns up and they think, they okay, then, then they got an electrical problem. Nobody is really even asking the question, how do I, how do I, um, you know, do a, an analysis or diagnosis, whether I have a cyber incident going on. Yeah. I mean, and we just need to raise that, raise that awareness too yeah. is okay. You know, walk up to a system that's no longer working and, and you have to add to your, uh, your, your uh, review and investigation could have been in a virtual command and not a lot of folks are doing that right now. And no. so that's, that's another thing that we were trying to raise awareness of. Matter of fact, We'll be conducting an exercise uh, for military engineers at events here later this year on 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 actually simulating an OT attack and what to look for, particularly when it brings down a critical military function. Right. Not a lot of engineers, uh, in both set private sector, as you know, or public sector, know how to uh, how viable that is, how feasible, how 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 um, potentially how how uh, much of a improbable it might be. Yeah. And then be able to include that in their, in their response. Yeah. It's I'm losing it's, words. <laughs> it's, it's a different world and and just how vastly different it is from it and OT. And in yeah. my experience working from both sides, right. Is, is a lot of times you get new, you know, it executives, it's managing OT and they, they just take, Hey, we've got all the, we've done all this stuff in it. Why don't I just take all that and push it down over there? And, yeah. and, and it, logically it makes sense. Let's push these policies and patching and all it just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work yeah. because of the availability, because of the safety. They don't have the same, uh, to your point, you handle in incidents different, situations different. Everything about it is different. I can't, they just don't work. It's oil and water and it, they just don't mix. So, uh, so I, okay, let me ask you a question. Let me turn around and interview you. Yeah. Um, so when I, when I go to conferences with CISOs, even the first thing I ask is, hey, how many CISOs are caring about OT? And, and there's like maybe two or three in the entire audience. Right. And, and so the question, the, the question becomes why? Well, because that's not my division. That's the, that's the operations division. Yep. So the question, that becomes, should they be combined or should they be separate? Um, uh, because they have a different way of responding. Uh, I'm torn. I, I'm more that the CISO should be caring about, about, about OT because ultimately the surveillance and controls could be uh, together. And so you could ultimately through an IT system in a building or an IT owner, uh, or an IT, you know, or or monitor, be able to detect, you know, um, uh, anomalies in the OT. I'm definitely against firewalls. The idea that you can firewall or separate your OT, okay, great. So then, what you have nobody monitoring that, and that right. and someone go run wild. So I do believe we need integration. Firewalls need to come down. And look, that's next prove that firewalls don't work and air gaps. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, I, we do want to have one person that understands. OT, but in a way that um, that they know they need to respond differently than an IT attack. So yes. I, I'm I'm moving more, and I'll, 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 I'll I'm sorry, that was a question to you. What no, do you think? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so for for CISOs, I've seen it all, but I, I agree. I think it all needs to it needs to land under under the CISO, in my opinion. Um, how can you manage and 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 manage security around? And and the Colonial Pipeline is a great example. If if I have one guy that's responsible for IT and that system comes up to this point and then the OT is a different responsibility. I have no, there's, there's always a gap in the middle. There's that DMZ in the middle. There's that no man's land. Nobody know who knows who owns what I've got systems that bridge both of those things. So who's responsible for it. And there's just no clear line of delineation. There's no ownership and there's no, there's no visibility and being able to, you know, you see a new vulnerability that comes out, whether it's Siemens or whatever PLC or control vendor that comes out, 
and they'll say, Hey, this nut, this PLC five, four, blah, 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 has these, these vulnerabilities on it. Well, that the IT side, they can pull up in their sourcing system. Hey, we've, we've ordered 7,000 of those. Where are they? And they turn to, and they don't know who to talk to. I yeah. know I have them. I don't know where they are. I don't know what they do. I don't know what function they're having. And there's no connection between those, the, all of those systems. There's no visibility across the entire enterprise to understand what the real risk is. Because I think the ultimate thing and, and what you're saying, and, and I think what we're, what we're all saying is, is this is all about risk. And mm -hmm. is it OT risk? It's safety risk. But ultimately the business the overall business has to own that risk. Now, yep. there definitely needs to be somebody with an operational understanding of these systems that is putting that his five cents or maybe you know more into the conversation, making sure that they're not overcomplicating or pushing IT policies down in OT. But ultimately, one person needs to own it that owns it all, or or you're not going to have a, a you know a, an understanding of the cyber risk that you have to your organization. Yeah, I agree. And and look, I, I'm I'm for the re the restoration or the incorporation of a chief risk officer um, yeah. that reports to the CEO that uh, understands insurance risk, understands you know, um, uh, you know financial risk, and understands physical risk. Yeah. Um, and to to particularly in the and you know if you have uh, physical assets within the control of your company, um, so I do believe you need a risk officer who can be responsible for assessing what's the best thing to do with that risk. And I've, I've actually seen a lot of CISOs tying over to legal and chief risk officers and, and actually moving that over because it's all around tying to risk. So that, that yeah. aligns. Hey, uh, a lightning round. I'm going to I'm going to be the first one to ask you a question. Sure. Who had a more extensive actor action report after the Colonial Pipeline attack, Colonial or Dark Side? <laughs> it would probably be Dark Side. Yeah, because I mean, you're right, because of the fact that the last thing that group wanted was to have congressmen calling for Navy SEALs to come in and kill them and their families. Exactly. I mean, they're businessmen. They yeah. just wanted to get their ransom and get out. And so I agree with you. I think probably dark side you know, learned, needed to learn more from that attack than the colonial did. OK, you hit me with a lightning round question. <laughs> what, what's something that's, that you're optimistic about over the next couple of years and all of this that we talked about scariness? But what's something you're optimistic about? Uh, I think the the the, um, the continued um, federal leadership uh, uh, emphasis on on getting after solutions, you know, and, and uh, to the degree for which they're effective or not, at least they're they're asking the questions and they're raising awareness. So I think that's something I'm, I'm often think about. And then and there's a lot of companies that are really offering some good stuff. Um, question is how do how do we put them with uh, together with markets that are relatively mature so they can buy that stuff? So I, I see a lot of innovation. Um, and, and I see a lot of continued emphasis. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that that ultimately the framework we developed is in a growth industry. That's awesome. So what, what's one thing you want somebody to take away from this? If they, if they could only grab one, one nugget from this conversation, what would it be? Join BCS. Uh, we, we, we are a nonprofit made up of companies um, <laughs> that share our vision and share our desire. Um, so the one thing I want to leave with the audience is is my uh, my email address, which is Lucian L U C I A N at buildingcybersecurity.org. Awesome. And we're also on LinkedIn. So that's the one thing I want to leave because we we do need to grow our reach. Uh, we need to grow uh, our, uh, our our ability to promulgate our framework. And anybody listening in who cares about safety for our kids and grandkids needs to understand what we are doing within BCS. Awesome. Thank you for your time today. We'll put all that stuff in the, in the show notes. So definitely yeah. reach out and join BCS. It's a great organization to be part of. Yeah. And it's, um, and it's something I think everyone will love because it, it uh, we are trying to change the world. You know, it's very, very few times you can actually be associated with a cause that's bigger than yourself. You're trying to make the world a safer place. Um, so I, I, I would love to have you, Aaron. I'm going to recruit you personally <laughs> to be a spokesman for BCS, but uh, anybody else would like to join, that'd be great. Awesome. Hey, thank you for your time, sir. I really appreciate this conversation. All right, Aaron, you have a you have a good uh, good uh, good uh, weekend. Look forward to talking to you again soon. Yes, sir. Thank you.